Yeah, it's a tough, it's a draw. Eh, it's not a draw. I'm going to say two because people may know one and won't know the other one. Uh, they're both outside hitters. And the one I'd mentioned before, one is Riley Salmon from Texas. Just because he has been overlooked his entire life. 6'2". I mean, he wouldn't even think he was a viable player. We saw him walking down the street. But just a fierce competitor. Can pass, can set, can hit. Great team leader, great communicator. Um, by far one of my favorite guys ever to play with. And the second one is a guy I played with for th four years in Russia. I just won a gold medal for them, uh, Sergei Tatukin. Uh, you know, he's played in there. Uh, I met him in Italy when he played there for a couple of years. And then he's been back in Russia playing in their pro league. He's won, I don't know, 12 Russian titles. He's won four European titles. Uh, you know, he's had three Olympic medals, but not gold. Uh, once our team lost, I was really pulling for Russia. Uh, I have a lot of friends in that team, but none bigger than Sergey. You know, he's almost my age, uh, like I was searching for that final piece of his collection, and now he has it. And just, I've never knew a guy like Sergey. You know, some people who, who want the last shot in basketball, who want the puck at the end of the game, you know. Sergey's the guy that would never say anything to me, never complain about anything, until it was time that our team made a point, and he'd say, Loy, and just give me the look. And I knew it was time to set Sergey, and he'd always bring it home. He was just a clutch, clutch guy. You know, as you get older, that's what you, you know, that's what you look forward to in playing with some guys like that. It's just guys like Bird and, and you know Magic and, and Sergey and Riley, who just when the big moment shows up, they're not afraid. You know, they're not afraid of the moment. And it was awesome playing with him. Because I was the only one who had good hands? No. Uh, you know, I was, started out as an attacker uh, because of my height, but uh, because we were kind of limited in numbers, and back then we ran a 6-2 uh, with two setters, uh, there was only two of us who could really set, and I kind of developed from there. Dad, uh, my dad, Arnie Ball, realized I had pretty soft hands and understood the game, uh, and I enjoyed setting, uh, kind of being the quarterback on the team, so I just kind of uh, progressed and stayed in that role. Yeah, you know, quarterback, you know, a lot of analogies, like, uh, I mean, uh, the setter's like the quarterback, setter's like the point guard. I yeah. mean, we're kind of the playmakers of the team. You know, I always tell people, I don't know why people yell at setters, because if you yell at me, I can guarantee you, you will not see the ball <laughs> the entire game. And so, and yes, we do take bribes, uh, but, uh, you know, we determine who gets the ball, how they get it, when they get it. And so it's kind of a, just like with, with the point guard, you know, and you have to know, is, is the guy's jumper on? If, if it is, got to keep giving the ball. You know, if a guy like Riley or Sergey or Case, Clay Stanley is killing the ball, you got to keep giving it to him. You know, if he's not, is he a kind of guy where he needs another one to kind of get back into it? Or is it a guy where you leave him alone for a while? You know, you have to know uh, the opposing team. You know, what's a good matchup? We set this guy, but that guy's a good blocker? That's not a good idea. So the setter has a million things going on right before he lets go of the ball. Because even if I call a play and everyone thinks the ball's going here, at the last second if I see or feel something different, I'll set somebody else. Because my job is to make sure we get a side out or we get a point. Not necessarily make sure everybody's happy or everybody's even or, or, or something like that. So it's a, it's a thankless job, though, because uh, in the papers, uh, you know, when you win, it's the big spiker who had 15 points. You know, and if you lose, well, it's the setter's fault because he didn't set the right people. But uh, anyone who knows volleyball knows that you know, the setter makes, makes the wheel turn. You know, the setter makes the, the game happen. Yeah, there's been a lot of teams where I've lost a lot of weight running around chasing down their bad passes. You know, it's always funny. I always tell people that I say, you know, it's funny how hitters complain, you know, about uh, about the sets. And then as soon as you say, well, you know, if you pass the ball a little better and a little closer to me, maybe the set would be a little better. And they're like, oh, yeah, maybe that is true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the game of volleyball has changed. Obviously, now uh, serving is much stronger, especially now that you can hit the net. If the ball goes over and it still, it still counts. It's, you know, it's not illegal like it used to be. A lot of guys are jump serving, hitting the ball anywhere from 80 to 85 miles an hour. They're not doing that. They're jump float serving where the ball is coming at you like this, where you can actually read the word Makasa or Molten on it as it comes along, which is hard to pass. And so, you know, offensive have been simplified. You know, before, when I started playing a long time ago, back when we actually used a white ball, you know, we only had two primary passers to pass the entire volleyball court. Where now, the serves are so strong and so fast, we use three to four players to actually pass the first ball each time, or bump it, as people yeah. call it. So we, we run plays where we'll have a, one of the big guys in the middle. You know, if the pass is good enough, he'll come in for a quick attack where he hits the ball right on my hands real quick. You know, we used to run a play where the opposite would come around for an X2. Well, 
Now, because the middle blockers are so big, they can do a quick jump and then jump again. We don't run that anymore. You know, we'll have this guy on the right side hit over here. We'll have someone in the back row jump behind that line you see on the court, 10 foot lines, 10 feet from the net to this line. And you can attack the ball in front of that line as long as you jump from behind it. So that's where you see a pipe, they call most of the times. The middle of the court guy from jump behind that line, fly towards the net, and then kill a ball over the quick attack. And then, of course, there's the left side attack. So anywhere from three to four guys will be running different plays at a time. And it's my job to kind of direct them where to go and then give them the kind of ball they want. Some like it high and slow, some like it fast, some like it inside, outside. As a setter, you have to kind of know the hitter's tendencies and know what they like to do. But in the end, the most important thing is to get them in a good situation to try to get the ball killed on the ground, on the court, on the other side of the net. And so pass comes, I set, all the hitters are in motion, and then hopefully it works the first time. If not, we get ready to block, and hopefully we can stop them on defense. Yeah, the perfect pass. What's your favorite set? Quick. Even on a bad pass. You know, my, 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 uh, anyone who did a scouting report on me will know that I am a... I'm a quick setter. You know, if it's 12 feet, 10 feet, perfect pass. If I like the matchup, I'm going to set quick. It's just the easiest way to get a kill. And we were lucky enough to have a bunch of guys, Tom Hoff, Ryan Millar, David Lee, you know, throughout my career who uh, could kill the ball. And, and after playing with me one week in practice, they knew to be ready because I would throw it in there from anywhere. I mean, I love setting the ball sideways into them. You know, I just always figure that's the easiest way to get a point. The big guy, Clay Stanley, behind me will always be there. And it just sets everybody else up. And so... Uh, yeah, anybody who had scouting reports on me knew that the other team's middle blocker would always follow ours because I would find them. Absolutely. I, I think it's helped and hurt the game. You know, Libero has, has helped the game just as far as it's one more receiver in there who can pass the ball well, so offenses are better. Uh, it adds one better defensive player, so there tends to be more rallies, which if you've seen any men's volleyball, we're not a rally sport. Right. Uh, women's sport is the back and forth. Well, men's more like one, two, boom. One, two, boom. You know, occasionally there's a rally, but most of the time there's not. So it's helped the rallies, it's helped the ball control of the team. But I also think it's hurt because now they always come in for the big middle blockers, the big center players. So now those guys don't learn how to play defense. They don't learn how to set the ball because after they serve, then they just go out and sit down for three rotations. So I'd like to see it kind of go back where everybody has to know all the positions because there's always a time in a game where I'll make a great defensive play. And then here comes our lumbering seven-foot middle blocker to try to set and the ball will come out. You know, like he has oil on his hands, the referee will make a call and he'll lose a point. You know, or before, because they had to play all the way around and there was no Libro, they had good hands, they had good ball control. So it's helped and hurt the game. When I was younger, it was more just frivolous garbage, you know, probably more of my insecurities <laughs> than anything else. You know, people get nervous and they start chatting or someone chats with you, you start chatting back. Uh, I remember the match in uh, Sydney after we lost to Italy. There was a lot of... Uh, you know, language that we can't use because children may watch this being said, you know, under the net, back and forth in, in Italian and in, in English. And so, but every, but every, you know, team has rivalries. You know, we, uh, us and the Italians have never, you know, seen eye to eye. You know, us and the Brazilians never seen eye to eye. Um, just like Cuba and the Russians are terrible talking through the net. And so, yeah, I was, I was chatty. And then there was a period of time that I really wasn't. I was just focused on my play. And then here at the end, as you got to become an old dog, as they called me, or in Russia, I was known as the dinosaur, but still, but still winning and still balling, still gaming. You know, you'd always, you know, when the young guys would try to do something, they'd hit one straight down and you just yell through the net at you. And you just kind of look at your head. And then, you know, I'd set right against them the next three balls and we'd bury them. And then I just each time could look at them and say something, look at them and say something, look at them and say something. And then by the end, you know, they kind of go home with their tail between their legs. And it's a different kind of chatting. You know, not so much the, you know, the yelling and screaming is just the letting them know that. I'm still top dog. <laughs> you know, I had a goatee going in, then we won, and then we won again, and then I just decided to roll with it, a little superstitious. You know, wore the same socks all eight matches. Washed them, of course, but same, uh, you know, same spandex, same everything. So I figured I might as well not shave. I mean, it was working. Yeah, I'm a little superstitious. You know, I've talked about it in the book and some other interviews and stuff like that. I think most athletes are. They may not admit it. You know, if I... Uh, you know, I always put the left sock on before the right, left shoe before the right. You know, I, I always eat the same, after we win, I always eat the same meal, listen to the same songs. You know, if we lose, then I'll change it up. Um, you know, the shaving thing's kind of similar. I did it uh, pretty much about the last, well, actually, actually since I was 28. You know, we get in the playoffs, kind of like the hockey players do. If you're winning, you just don't mess with it. You know, you don't get a haircut, you don't shave the beard. Um, you know, you just kind of, 
I mean, you obviously still, you know, wash and shower and change your clothes and stuff, but, you know, just a little superstition I think a lot of athletes have, and I'm no different. Uh, you know, they're all related to volleyball or my family. Um, you know, both kids' names on the arm, Sarah's on the arm. Um, you know, Olympic rings, obviously. Um, you know, the the, Be the Beijing medal here on, here on my hand, on my arm. You know, just I've been an amazing journey. You know, I've been to over 40 different countries. You know, I've filled up four passports. Uh, you know, I can speak Italian. I can I can speak some other languages. Um, you know, I've played in front of hundreds of thousands of people, and, and I guess millions and billions on TV if you count that. I just when the moment hits and I feel like there's something I need to represent, you know, I put it on. You know, this, this Russian one here is the, the symbol of the Republic to Tartistan, where I played in Kazan for five years, you know, and we won uh, nine titles there. I mean, it, it's unprecedented. You know, they have my jersey hanging up in a Russian gym, number one, Lloyd Ball, which has never been done before. You know, never had a retired jersey from a foreign player. And so I felt that was something so prevalent, so important in my life that, de that it deserved a tattoo. And so, I'll continue to get them as uh, my life unfolds and as I s transfer, in, you know, from athlete into whatever <laughs> comes next. And, um, you know, my mom's always like, well, why don't you just keep a journal and write them down? I said, save your body. I was like, ah, it's not as much fun as going to the tattoo parlor and getting a little ink done. So I met my wife, uh, her name was Sarah Weinbrenner, uh, at a bonfire out of New Haven. I was a sophomore at IPFW, she was a freshman. Uh, and this is going to sound a little cheesy and Hollywood-esque, but it's true. Uh, we got there a little late, and it was one of those out, you know, at uh, some farm, and someone had a keg and a bonfire or whatever, and me and my buddies were on one side, we just showed up, and uh, she was on the other side of the bonfire talking to a girl that I had known, our fathers knew each other. And I say, hey, do you guys know who that is? And they're like, no. And, and so before we can even get our, our, our first uh, beer from the keg, or before we can walk over there, uh, the sheriffs show up <laughs> to break up the party. And so, uh, of course, all the kids you know, who'd, who'd been drinking and maybe shouldn't have took off. And they're all running through the cornfields, and they're all trying to hide. And me and my friends just stand there. And the sheriffs you know, are like, well, and I said, well, sir, you know, one, I'm 21, but two, I'm not drinking, and blah, blah, blah. And so, we leave, and I'm thinking, well, that was a missed opportunity right there. I saw this beautiful, you know, tall blonde girl, and sure enough, the very next day at Kettler Hall, I hadn't seen her at all during the school year, Kettler Hall, I'm standing in front of the Mastodon Bones there with my friends, she walks by. And my, my friend who played on the team goes, hey, do you know that girl? I, said, I just saw her the other night at the party. I was trying to say hello to her. And so he's like, well, I'm going to go ask her out. And I quick shove him, <laughs> and I go ask her out. And she said yes, went to Cheddar's, our first date where uh, she had uh, chicken tenders and a salad, I remember. And um, yeah, you know, 20 years later, uh, dated for five years, married now for 15, and uh, been together. And uh, it was by far the best choice I ever made. You know, I'm not sure she said the same thing. But <laughs> Yeah.